This videotape, which is one in a series, is intended for interpreters, students, educators, parents, and members of the deaf community. It is designed to provide the viewer with a better understanding of multiculturalism and diversity within the American deaf community. The presenter on this videotape has generously agreed to share her experiences and perspectives of being deaf and having grown up in Pakistan. The experiences expressed by the presenter on this tape are her own. They are not necessarily representative of the experiences of other members of the deaf community. The presenter's experiences are highly personal and are to be respected. They are not meant to denigrate or insult people with different experiences. The presenter's willingness to participate in this videotape series is greatly appreciated. We hope the viewer will watch this videotape with an open mind and will respect the presenter's individual experiences and perspectives. Hi, my name is Shahina, and this is my sign name. I'm from Pakistan. The sign for Pakistan is like this. I was actually born hearing, and later I became very ill, and that caused me to lose my hearing. We were never able to find out for sure when that was or what the specific cause of my deafness was, but it was around the age of one that my parents noticed that I was losing my hearing and eventually became completely deaf. Today I'll be telling you a little bit about my family, my educational background, my perspective as a cultural minority in the U.S., and just generally about my growing up experience and being a member of the deaf culture. Now, to tell you a little bit about my family, I have one sister and two brothers. Altogether, there are four children in the family with two parents. That makes us a family of six. I'm the only deaf person in my family. My parents and my siblings are all hearing. Growing up, and still to this day, we use a combination of speech reading and gestures and home signs primarily, as well as some Pakistani sign language to communicate. The spoken language in Pakistan is Urdu, and I'm a fairly adept lip reader of Urdu. So I'm able to communicate with my family fairly well on that level. I feel I'm more or less accepted in my family as a deaf person. I do remember about the age of 12, my dad, for some reason, really wanted to try to get me to be able to hear. He had heard about the cochlear implant surgery and wanted me to go through some tests and find out if I might be a good candidate for that surgery. And even at that young age, I remember telling my dad, it's not that important to me to be able to hear. I'm fine with myself being a deaf person, but my dad wanted to just pursue it long enough, I think, to satisfy himself. We filled out a lot of paperwork and forms, sent them off to the U.S., and waited to hear back. Interestingly enough, we never did hear back, and over time we almost forgot about it. Later when the subject did come up again, and my dad was wanting to pursue it a little bit further, I remember telling him again that I really liked myself as a deaf person and I didn't really have any interest in, in being able to hear. Now here in America you have closed caption television. In Pakistan we don't have that available. So anytime I wanted to watch a TV program or some kind of entertainment or a show of some kind, my family would try and interpret for me. They would give me as much as they could in sign language. Especially, you know, I would want to know what the jokes were when I saw everybody else laughing. A few of my cousins are also able to sign, 
And so usually I would be with family and someone would be able to sort of fill me in on what was going on around me in spite of the fact that we didn't have captioning. Once in a great while on a public television show there might be captioning written in Urdu of course. And it was an interesting new experience for me to come to the states where you have captioning and it's much more common and now I can sort of get the jokes at the same time everybody else does. I just recently was introduced to DVDs that have the captioning already on them. I never realized how much captioning would make a difference. And the captioning even came up and said, Welcome Shahina, how would you like to program your DVD player? So now when my family wants to rent a DVD, I know that it will already be captioned. And that was something that I had never experienced before. So captioning is cool. There are so many more things that I'm able to enjoy with the benefit of captioning that I never would have been able to enjoy before. So captioning has changed my life. One of the first and only signs that my family knew with me for a long time was the sign for work. I was probably around, how old would I have been? About eight. That would have been 1986. Anyway, we had gone to England to visit and my family was interested in seeing what the sign language programs were that were available in Britain. And when we met with some representatives from a deaf education program there, they taught my family this sign, the British sign for work. And so that was one of the first signs that my family really knew. It's similar to the sign that you use in ASL. But for some reason that was an easy, quick sign that my family just picked up on immediately and somehow that was the favorite sign, whether it was, you know, get ready to cook, get ready to clean up, whatever. It was, hey Shahina, work, work. That was a sign I saw a lot as a child. Of course, this later became a joke among myself and some of my deaf friends because they were impressed with how much sign language my family was able to use to communicate with me. And I would always say, no, actually, they only know one sign. Work, 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 work. I'd like to tell you a little bit now about my educational background. I went to a deaf school. I went as a day student, so I commuted back and forth to school every day. Most of the teachers were hearing, although all of them could sign. And I remember having a wonderful experience at the deaf school. We took classes in a variety of subjects, from art to science to English. I attended the deaf school for 12 years and upon graduating from there, entered a mainstream art school to get my art diploma. I attended that art school for four years. There were no interpreting services available there. They just simply were not offered. But because I had a hearing family and was used to communicating through speech reading and gestures, I knew that I would be able to succeed in the art school by applying those same techniques for communication in the classroom. There were several deaf students in the beginning, although two of them eventually decided to leave the school because they got really frustrated with the communication system, not being able to have direct access to the lectures and so forth. 
but myself and two other deaf students were able to get through the four years of art school by borrowing notes from classmates, relying on further one-on-one -on -one help with the instructor, asking friends to write things down for us, and doing the best we could with speech reading. So I graduated after four years with a diploma in art and began looking for a job. I worked for a short time as an art teacher for about a month I taught in a school for deaf children taught art classes there and then decided to leave there to go and do some intensive English language study for about a year Although, again, not having interpreters became an issue. After a year of intensive English language study, in 1998, I moved to Houston, Texas, and began taking ASL. I started in ASL 2. As you know, Pakistani Sign Language and American Sign Language are different. And so upon coming to the States, I had to learn ASL so that I would be able to communicate with other deaf people as well as with interpreters. Learning ASL was not too difficult for me. I had the fortunate experience of having had some exposure to ASL while I was still in Pakistan. I remember a hearing couple who had a deaf son from the States came to visit some friends of mine in Pakistan. They were in Pakistan for some reason related to the husband's line of work. And of course, I was excited to meet another deaf person from another country. They stayed for several weeks. And during that time, he would show me the ASL signs for things, and I would show him the Pakistani sign language for things. And I became really fascinated with the similarities and differences between American and Pakistani sign language. It was fascinating to me to learn a different sign language, a whole different way of expressing oneself through sign language. So when I did come to the States, having already had that little bit of exposure to ASL was fortunate because I was able to pick up ASL much more quickly than I think I would have otherwise been able to. After about five months in Houston, I moved to Oregon where I'm currently attending Western Oregon University. And now I'm a full-time university student with a major in art. Last year I was able to take advanced ASL. I didn't take any of the intermediate classes, I just went straight up to the advanced level ASL. And of course I'm still learning I've done some work now as a tutor for hearing students who are learning ASL. I've greatly enjoyed that. I also recently shipped in a number of my paintings from Pakistan and was able to exhibit them in my first student art show. That was really a proud moment for me because for a long time I've wanted to be able to display my work in a show here. So that was really exciting for me to be able to show my artwork. That was really an exhilarating experience. It had been a goal of mine for a long time to have my work displayed in a show. Another thing that I've been involved with since being here at Western is traveling around to different elementary, middle, and high schools and sharing about my culture and my experience as an exchange student here in Oregon. That's also been something that's been extremely gratifying for me. Now I'd like to tell you a little bit about working with interpreters for the first time. As I explained before, the art school that I went to in Pakistan didn't have any interpreting services. They just weren't available. So when I first moved to the U.S., Houston, Texas was the first place that I lived. 
and I started taking classes at a community college there, that was my first experience ever working with an interpreter. So I remember getting into class and seeing this interpreter there for the first time. And one of the things that was confusing for me was trying to figure out if the interpreter was just speaking for themselves or if they were conveying something that someone else had said. Of course, I was also trying to take in the information in English, what was printed on the page and so forth. And so trying to look down and take in the information in English and take in the information from the interpreter, it was sort of overwhelming at first. Because I had not grown up working with professional interpreters, I hadn't internalized a lot of those rules and norms about working with interpreters that deaf students here in America are probably a lot more accustomed to. And I pretty much just took everything at face value because I didn't have anything to compare it to. And it wasn't until later when I came to Oregon and had experience with more than just one interpreter that I realized some of the things that were done there might have been a little less than professional, hadn't really followed the professional interpreting rules and guidelines. So when I compared my experience with interpreters here at Western to the experience with the one interpreter that I had worked with in Houston, I started to recognize how many differences there were between the attitude and just the approach to interpreting. And I know that some of the things, like I said, that were done in Houston were probably not real appropriate. One of the ways that I came to know about this was when I walked into a class and an interpreter came in and apologized profusely for not having remembered to take off her red nail polish. And I, of course, didn't mind at all. It wasn't a big deal to me. And I told her, no, don't worry about it. It doesn't bother me. She still continued to apologize. And I had never had anyone apologize to me for something like that before, and I couldn't quite figure out what the problem was. And I started looking back and thinking, oh, well, my interpreter in Houston at the community college always had pink nail polish and never apologized to me for it. So I was surprised to see interpreters apologizing for things like that. Finally, someone explained to me what I had never learned, having never grown up using interpreters, which is there are certain standards and expectations for professional interpreters that I just wasn't aware of. That was the first time that that ever really made sense to me. It was really interesting to me to learn about that when I actually asked some of my deaf and hard of hearing friends who are American if they were aware of these interpreter guidelines all of them seem to have internalized that from a very young age. They knew exactly what I was talking about and could count off a half a dozen rules that interpreters were expected to follow that I had never heard of before. So now I know a lot more what to expect when I work with an interpreter. I wish I had known that before when I had been at the community college in Houston, but you live and learn. My experience here at Western with the interpreters has been really positive. Like I said, I was only able to work with one interpreter in Houston. Also in Houston, there's more of a shortage of interpreters, and I often had to share one interpreter between several deaf students, which wasn't always terribly convenient. Now I work with a variety of interpreters on a daily basis, which has been a really good experience. Now looking back, I wish that interpreting services had been available at the college that I went to in Pakistan, and hopefully they will be someday. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about my identity as a deaf person, as well as my identity as a member of a cultural minority group here in the U.S. 
Really, I consider myself a member of two cultural minority groups, that of the deaf culture, as well as being an international student. When I first came here, most of the first people that I met were other international students who, of course, were all hearing. And most of them were interested in learning some sign language. I was really honored by how patient they were with writing back and forth with me and trying to learn as much sign language as they could. But at the same time, it was a struggle to communicate, and I did frequently find myself left out on the fringes. It wasn't until I had been here for a few weeks that I met some other deaf people who then introduced me to a number of their deaf friends. And the next thing you know, I'm in the ASL club with not only deaf, but other hearing students who can sign. And with the direct access to communication through ASL, I had finally found my niche. I had finally found a place where I felt comfortable. And even though the international student organization was wonderful and very respectful and we did our best to communicate and get along the best we could, we didn't have the common language. So even though they were wonderful people, I was finding myself much more drawn to the deaf community just because of how easy and direct the communication access was. This was also somewhat different than my experience in Pakistan because I came to really identify myself as a member of the deaf culture. This was an idea that I had never really been exposed to in Pakistan. One of the things I've realized is how much in common the deaf community in Pakistan has with the deaf community in America. We share many of the same experiences, frustrations with communication, feeling ignored or left out by our hearing friends and family members who, as much as they love and respect us, may not fully be able to empathize with what it's like to be deaf. One of the things I've realized since coming to the States is that the deaf culture is something that is shared between members of the Pakistani deaf culture and members of the American deaf culture. As I said, this idea of deaf culture was new to me when I first came to the States. I had never thought to really define myself as culturally different from the other people in my country, even though they were hearing and I was deaf. It took me some time to understand what it meant to be a part of the deaf culture and to understand why it was so important for so many of my deaf friends to advocate for themselves as members of a minority culture and to fight for their rights and to identify themselves as culturally distinct from the majority. One of the things I'm sure many American deaf people can relate with as well is the all too common story of being the only deaf person at the family gatherings, whether you're around the dinner table with just your brothers and sisters or everybody's together for the holidays. You look around and you see everybody cracking up laughing and you ask one of your brothers or sisters or your mom or somebody to interpret for you and tell you what was so funny and you were always told, oh, I'll tell you later, I'll tell you later. Now, most of the time, when you think to ask them later, they'll say, oh, uh, I don't even remember what was so funny. Now, if you ask what's funny, and they say they'll tell you later, and they actually do try to tell you later, because they actually remembered, so often it ends up being something that seems so trivial and silly, and I never would really understand what was so funny in the first place. That's an experience that I'm sure members of both the Pakistani and American deaf communities can relate to. So even though our sign languages are different, our experiences are much the same. The opportunities for deaf people in Pakistan are more limited, I would say, than the opportunities for deaf people here in the U.S. There seems to be more support services available in the U.S. 
And I think because of deaf people identifying themselves as a cultural minority and advocating for their rights in the ways that they have, they've opened a lot of doors here in the U.S. that might not be open in Pakistan. Now, I've talked about being a member of the deaf community and how that's important for my cultural identity. But that doesn't mean that I only want to hang out with deaf people. I want to be able to be with deaf people or hearing people. The point is I just never want to feel inferior to anyone. I grew up with a hearing family who loves me just the way I am and I love them. So even though I'm a member of the deaf community, that doesn't mean I value one community over the other. I love them both. Now, before we close, I'd like to show you a few examples from Pakistani Sign Language with their American Sign Language equivalents just for fun. I'd like you to be able to see some of the differences between the two sign languages. In ASL, this sign you use to mean understand. In Pakistan, we use the same sign, but it has a different meaning. It means angry or mad. So if you signed understand, in Pakistan, you would really be telling someone that you're mad. Another example is this sign that you use for conference in ASL, showing people meeting together. In Pakistan, our sign for conference is more like your sign for communicate or conversation. I think that's an interesting difference. Of course, there are many, many, many examples that I could give you of the differences between the two sign languages. I think that ASL is more similar to European sign languages, whereas Pakistani sign language is just more unique. I'd like you to show you the numbers 1 through 20 in both ASL and Pakistani sign languages. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20. That's ASL. Now for Pakistani Sign Language, it would look like this. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Or sometimes you can sign it 1, 0. Either way. 11, 12, 13, excuse me, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20. So you can see the differences in the way we count. The hardest thing for me, being used to counting in Pakistani Sign Language, is the difference in the number three. It was so hard for me to get used to. So frequently, I would say six when I meant three, because our sign in Pakistani Sign Language for three is what you use for six. So people will ask me my age, and I'll tell them I'm 26, when in my mind I'm telling them I'm 23. And then they think I'm quite a bit older than I really am. That was a hard adjustment for me to make, was the number three with the thumb out instead of the way you would sign six. So now I've told you a little bit about my background, my experience coming here to the States, my cultural identity as both a deaf person and a person from Pakistan. I know I share a hope with many other members of the deaf community, and that is that in the future we see even more interaction between the deaf and hearing communities and an ever-growing mutual respect between the two cultures. And in the future, I hope that we will continue to strive for equality. Thank you very much. <laughs>